What's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? It's Jay Shep back with Artist to Artist, episode two. Yesterday felt so good um, as we're listening to the music of John Ango. He's got a song out called I Am Royalty, and it's on my uh, Jay Shep Top 10 Urban Gospel playlist, and I'll let that play a little bit, um, but I'm going to speak a little bit first. Um, yesterday felt so good to get the first show in the way. I'm not going to say out of the way. I wanted it to get in the way because I wanted to be able to um, <clears throat> just do something that I've, I've been dreaming about doing for a while, and um, I kind of see... Um, the path that's being laid out before me. So I'm grateful for everyone who tuned in yesterday and for those who are going to tune in today and watch the rebroadcast of this. Um, Artist to Artist is a platform that I want to create that is going to bring insight and inspiration to those who are in the creative arts, whether it's music, whether it's film, whether it's television or acting or whatever it is that, that you're doing in the realm of the arts. So I want to play a little bit of this song um, right now from this guy. Just man. So the other day I was in the car. We were headed to church and uh, my wife had her Spotify playlist uh, going in the car. And, you know, now I'm just I'm really just in the mood to just discover new people. Um, just find new people and just hear hear new music and just find different ideas. And so I came across this um, this guy named John Ango. I believe he's from Africa. I think he's from Nigeria. But um, we've been having some conversations back and forth uh, on IG, and I'm going to get him on the show to interview him. But he's got a song called Iron Royalty. So I'll let that play a little bit. So I appreciate when I when I hear new artists and they come out and they really just have confidence in their abilities and they're really putting themselves out there in such a way that that the world can hear. And I, the beautiful thing about um, music right now with streaming is that you can hear and discover people that you never would have ever heard before. That's what the new world is doing. That's what the new music model is. That's what the new business is doing. It is allowing for people to merge different ideas and people from all over the world, all over the globe can come together and just share their gift and share their craft. So I appreciate this guy, John Ango. He's going to be on the show either next month. Uh, yeah, we're going to shoot for May to have him on the show. And he's out on the road touring, doing a lot of good stuff. Um, so I'll bring this down a little bit. So I want to share with you guys a little bit of music news. Um, so yesterday, the big story of the day yesterday was that Meek Mill got released from prison, right? So in you, if any of you all know who Meek Mill is, any hip hop fans, Meek Mill is a, a rapper and, um, I I don't even know how long he had been in jail. I believe it was like three or four months. But um, evidently, he got put in jail on some, you know, kind of some bogus charges. And I, I saw an interview that, um, that Jay-Z did. If you all have Netflix, there's a um, it's a really cool. David Letterman has a show on Netflix like he's interviewing people. And um, he sat down with Jay-Z. I'm going to get the name of this um, this particular show, and I'll put it in my comments later. But um, Jay-Z was talking about the, the Meek Mill case and how um, they've been fighting for him to be freed since he got in. I think he was, like, doing wheelies on a motorcycle or something. 
um, in Philly when he was uh, shooting a music video and he got uh, put back in jail. And uh, so he was released yesterday and um, he was at the Philadelphia 76ers game with Kevin Hart and all that. So uh, hopefully everything is going to go well for him, for Brother Meek. Um, I, you know, cause I don't wish incarceration on anyone if, if, you know, if they're wrongly accused or if it's just like very unfair, I don't wish that upon anyone. Um, what I do find interesting was the amount of people and the amount of types of people that were coming to the defense of Meek Mill. So like the Patriots owner, Tom, Cra Bob Kraft, rather. Bob Kraft went to visit Meek Mill in jail a couple times. And I'm like, what is that? What is that about? Like, I don't see the connection. You know, did you go see Aaron Hernandez in jail? You know, but you going to see Meek Mill. I don't, I don't get that. So I don't, I don't get the, um, the connection where, why this became such a, a high profile, get this guy out of jail case. Um, you know, but I'm glad he's out and um, hopefully there'll be some good music that comes out. And uh, so even uh, so he was courtside with Kevin Hart. And uh, the funny thing that's happening on the Internet, <laughs> the funniest meme I've seen today uh, what was a video of, of Joel and B picked Kevin Hart up like he was a baby, like <laughs> he picked him up. And like threw him up in the air and uh like you know the internet went crazy over that so uh if i find that video i'll post it on my page i thought that was hilarious um so yeah meek mill is out of jail so we'll probably be hearing new music from brother meek uh in no time and he's probably got music that's um you know that's in the can anyway which is uh, something else i want to talk about for artists um this is a day and age um where it's going to be imperative for you as an artist to always have your content ready okay so if you are a musician if you're a singer a songwriter whatever it is that you're doing the name of the game right now is content and not just content how good is your content? And here's the next word. How are you going to scale your content? All right. So here's first, here's the first rule. If you, if you're a rapper, if you're a singer, like whatever it is, you got to have songs. All right. You got to write the song. You got to get in the studio and finish the song. That's content. Content is not what's in your brain. That's not content. That's potential. So you got to get the potential out of your brain and it's got to become physical. So your content becomes physical. All right. It becomes your physical intellectual property. So you got to get your content ready. So when it's time for you to release something, you always have something to put out. I think, um, and I, I had a very good discussion yesterday with Gary Mays and shout out to Gary Mays for, for being a part of my first show. And thank you guys for jumping in and watching. Feel free to uh, hit the like button, the love button, leave a comment, uh, share it, whatever, whatever it is that you, that you uh, feel like doing and, you know, leave any questions that you guys may have. We had a great discussion yesterday around um, music streaming. And, you know, he brought up some some amazing points and uh, we kind of differ in our opinions. And, I, and that's good. I'm glad I have this show. Where we can kind of openly discuss um, our, our thoughts about things, especially as it pertains to the to the model. And I'm not even going to call it the new music model because it's not new anymore. It's been happening. The, it's the it's the model that's been happening for nearly seven, eight years. So that's not. You know, it's new, but we got to come around to it. <clears throat> and so the idea about building content to continue continuously flow, if you are a musician, a singer, um, whatever, whatever, whatever it is that you do in your artistry, do you know how many ways there are to build your personal brand, 
to build your your personal type of artistry to share your craft. And so, excuse me, what music streaming has become, it's become another avenue for your art to be shared. Now, like yesterday when Gary was bringing up the amount of pay that you receive for these platforms, that's a whole nother discussion. I think what's going to have to happen is, is that artists are going to have to block out and it's very hard. We're going to have to block out what something is paying us and we just have to do more of what we're good at and what we're great at. We're going to have to block out the, the pay. What, what we can't control is what Spotify pays. We can't, we cannot control what Apple Music pays. We cannot control that. So what's the answer? The answer is, is to control what you can control. So if you want to say, I'm going to build my personal music brand by keeping all of my music off of every streaming platform, and I'm only going to put it on my website, and I'm only going to play live shows and sell my stuff there, cool. You've got your plan, you've got your strategy, and if you feel that you can work it and make it in that way, I say go for it. Apple is building a facility in Nashville to be more involved in art. So tell us more about that, um, Rodney. Um, tell us more about the, from what you know about that. And I do have some news about Apple as well um, that I want to share. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to finish this point, and then I'm going to, um, if you got some more to comment on that, Rodney, feel free. So, well, artists, in my opinion, in my opinion, this is my opinion. So, which means that your you can have your opinion, and we can just discuss it and agree to disagree. But in my opinion, the people who are winning right now are the ones, especially uh, the ones who are doing it the new way. I can't count the old heads who already have an established name and they can kind of write off their name. There's a lot of people who are making it right now via streaming, via putting out singles, via just putting out content, 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 content continuously. The name of the game now is always recording, always producing, and always putting it out and never being attached to the outcomes in the beginning. Because if you're not preaching patience, if you're not going to have patience for things to come together, even the Bible says, let patience have our perfect work. And so as artists, we can be some of the most impatient people on the planet. You know why? Because we put our stuff out and we know our stuff is great. We know our stuff is hot. We know everybody should be dancing to our song. We know that everybody should be wearing our clothes. We know everybody should come to our website. We know that everybody should come to our concert and buy our tickets. We know every show that we do should be sold out. We know that. Everybody else don't know that. Everybody else ain't jumped in on that. So guess what? We get so attached to outcomes and we attach our success to the outcome of everything. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to have goals and you're going to have to have measurables. You're going to have to be able to measure and see what did I do here? How can I get better? How can I keep moving and improving? But if you are not going to evolve yourself and learn how to detach your um, your success from numbers, then you, you're going to be really chasing a carrot that you may never, ever catch. I'm going to read this comment here. They're planning to help bridge the gap for those who feel like music has lost its way and real artists are not being represented. The new school is adapting, whereas other artists are being lost or forgotten. <clears throat> so here's my, here's my idea. I have some radical ideas on artistry. And it may surprise some people because I feel like I am, I am a real artist. People know I'm a real musician, a real songwriter, real producer, grew up in church. I play, I play music, you know, I play by ear. I play, I'm a sight reader. I have a music degree. So you would look at me on first glance and be like, he's a real artist. But here's the thing. 
I'm careful now because I'm not going to call that EDM DJ who can't read music, who doesn't have the the um, the bandwidth. Hey, what's going on, Chrissy? Um, so I really just jumped in. I, I played a little music. I'm gonna play some more music, uh, and I'm just kind of reviewing what we talked about yesterday and just giving a little bit of music news and some artist tips right now. Um, but here's here's what's happening. There's a sector of of artists that become extremely territorial about whatever their gift is. And they think that because they can sing, dance, write, play, that they're the real artists and the people who can't play an instrument aren't real artists and they're not making real art. And, and you know what? You're going to have to shift your mind and perspective because that kid who's 13 years old, who can pick up his laptop and, and create a beat out of nothing and, and put it on the internet and be a global sensation, that's art as well. You may not like it, but that's art too. And so how the question is now, how can we have more powerful collaborations with people who are quote unquote so-called real artists with these other people who are figuring out the um the, the quote unquote cheat code to make it. That's going to be the people who make it and crush it and win at this thing. And, you know, in my, in my realm that I, uh, my realm of expertise in gospel artistry, who I, I love God, I feel that gospel artists have the most talented musicians ever birthed. I, I believe it's true. You can't, you can't prove that I'm wrong. But I believe also that gospel music is always the last to the party. We're always the last invited. We're, and, and we're in there in the scrap heap um, trying to figure stuff out after everybody won in a certain area. Everybody won in a certain area and ain't, ain't, nothing, ain't nothing worse than going to a party after everybody ate the food and you got there late and ain't no good food left. How many of y'all like going to the party and you see they had shrimp. You see they had like five kinds of orange chicken. They had they had the blood orange chicken. They had the um, South Beach orange chicken. They had the Mandarin Thai orange chicken. They had five types of orange chicken. And you get to the party and there's only one little piece of orange chicken left. And that that's the burnt end. That's what gospel does to itself. Because we want to be so insulated at times and stick to the old model that's not working in any other industry anywhere else. But we think, you know, we get we need to go back. That's the equivalent. I'm going to say this. When gospel artists say, let's go back, it's the equivalent of saying, make America great again. It's the same thing. It's the same thinking of saying, make America great again is the same thing when we go back and say, in my day, in this day, in so-and-so's day, you're saying the exact same thing as make America great again. Same person, same thing, same type of expression that the person that you talk about the most on social media that you hate, but you're, you're reflecting the same type of behaviors of this person that you say you can't stand. And so people talk about being on a quote unquote right side of history. Artists have to learn how to be on the right side of history as well. As far as how you create and flush and put your stuff out there. I'm not saying you got to think like everybody else. Because artistry, as Rodney said, artistry is all about expression. So <clears throat> the the person that's singing um, folk music and the, and the person that's singing rock music, they're singing from their perspective. The person that sings gospel and then the person that does uh, dance music, they're they're all, you're only going to perform from whatever perspective that you're coming from in artistry. And so what I want to challenge gospel artists is um, because that's my once again, it's my field of expertise is that we get away from judging um, someone else's art. I think I think we we get inside of judging like art big time. 
and just people, period. I'm sorry, here we go. I don't think the gospel industry can gamble like the other gospel, other genres of music. What do you mean by gamble, Chrissy? Um, elaborate a little bit more before before I get feedback on your post. I think I know where you're trying to go, but um, just give me a little bit more. I feel like the gospel genre puts artists in a one-dimensional box, unless it's CCM or inspiration, to be honest. Okay, Tani, I hear you. So even the whole <laughs> the whole CCM movement of what we've been talking about, uh, a lot of, I see a lot of people talking about, and I'm gonna bring, um, I need to bring Nick Johnson in on this discussion. Um, I need to bring Nick in because I want to talk to him about this, like in a in an open forum, so I can, so he can get his thoughts. So I want to hear him verbalize it because I want to have a discussion with him about this. But Nick Johnson, who's a fabulous musician, bass player, producer in Houston. Um, cool, cool guy, a good friend of mine, is, it talks about his frustration in playing quote-unquote CCM music. <clears throat> and my counter to that is make the music that you want to make. <laughs> I, so Kelly Clarkson is not going to complain about the music that the Migos are making. Kelly Clarkson is in her own lane being Kelly and Migos is in a lane being Migos. So gospel, we want to tell other, other gospel artists like what they should and shouldn't be playing. What's acceptable in church and what's not acceptable in church. Like st play at your church, figure out your sound and rock that. Don't tell me that this sound is better than that sound. No, the sound that's better is whatever came out of your brain. That's that's the sound that's going to work. I'm trying to give artists some like real surefire tips for you to win. One thing I'm doing right now, and one reason that I'm doing this show, created my Spotify playlist, is because I've, I've figured something out. If I really help others shine and be great, that only helps me. I get a great amount of gratitude from speaking to someone like Cheryl Fortune. And I'm going to play her song in a minute. And I tell Cheryl Fortune, you are my favorite singer. I love your voice. I love your music. I love your songs. I love your sound. Her sound is not a conventional gospel sound. Now, what if I would have said, girl, you sound good, but why you didn't do a so-and-so on your record? It's her record. Artists don't have any right we have no right to criticize another artist for the type of art they're making. We have no right. We don't. It's not our right to, to criticize someone else's art. You don't have to like it, but to criticize it openly, that's something that has to stop. It has to cease because we'll never grow. We got some more people watching. Great concept, bro. Appreciate it, man. What's up, Sid? I want to say I want to do an interview with you, too. Uh, like taking risk and bridge the gap. I think gospel can only go so far because it loses its value in the message. I hear you, Chrissy. And I agree with that. I do agree with that. Um, and not even to an extent. I, I agree totally with that because it's going to be hard to. And I, and when I say sell, I don't mean monetarily. I mean, it's going to be hard to like to sell to people the concept of, you know, Cedric Ford doing a song with the Migos. That, that don't even sound right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like now some people could pull it off. There there's some people who can absolutely pull it off. Kurt Franklin can pull pull off doing a song with with Kanye and Chance. Kurt can pull that off doing what he did in them songs. And and so the the thing is is that if if someone like um Donnie McClur McClurkin gets a call to do a song with a secular artist. It's got to be the right song. They got to have Donnie going to be like, I, you can't have me out here going. Brr, brr, skr. I'm not doing that. Donnie got to do his Donnie. You got to call him to be him. You know what I'm saying? Um, Marco says people are used to the same sound, right? You know, people are used to that, that same, you know, generated 
type of and and I get that like there's a place so here here's another thing like I'm really huge on this I'm really really huge on this another reason why I'm doing this show is to push people to create and not complain if you're busy complaining you're not creating nothing if you're busy talking about what somebody else did and somebody and Snoop this and that I don't care about Snoop make great. I'm glad Snoop made a gospel record. I'm not going to complain about it. Like I need to grind harder. So next time Snoop will call me, I'm in LA. Snoop could have called me. I'm not going to complain about that. It's whatever. Like the theological beliefs on it. It's a whole, that's a, you know, I'm not even going to get into that, but I'm saying like for, for artists, we, a lot of artists get into a complain mode and not a create this is a create industry create 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 release 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 create 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 release 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 you don't have time to complain you don't have time to complain every time i snap somebody else is in studio dropping bars every time i snap my finger somebody is in studio doing the next riff the next run somebody got their camera ready doing the next thing and that's what this industry is about this show artist to artist is for you guys to come you can vent here you can talk to me you can say whatever it is but i'm going to bring you back to who you are as an artist go write your song and put it out create it and put it out the numbers and the opportunities don't lie ccm inspiration has more of a reach Nowadays, unless a secular artist is promoting gospel, hence Snoop Dogg's album. The frustration with CCM partially is it's starting to sound the same way. Right. I get I get you on that. Um, hey, what's up, John Allen? Thank you. Bless you, too. Um, so here's what I would say about that, Tawny, is that when Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, um, uh, Lincoln Park, all these guys were creating the the sound of indie rock or alternative. They was playing the same chords. Like we complain about petty stuff. That's petty to me. I'm not. I'm not trying to talk about you. I'm not talking about you as an individual, Tony. I want to be clear. There's only so many ways that you can play the three chord in church. Dun, go to the four. Dun, go to the diminished. Dun. How many times have you been playing that? How many times have you heard? How many times have we heard that? Do we complain about that? We just about, oh, we had church. But it's the same thing that the church across the street played. Somebody hit the button on their NPC and it went. Some churches shout like this, some shout like this, some get on the wall, some lay out. It's the same thing. It's a different perspective. So so I challenge musicians who say, oh, I, I need to stretch. It's like you've been stretching your whole career. That's how you learned how to play. So nobody told you that you had to stop doing it. That's your fault that you didn't do it. That's your that's on you. So we do a lot of blaming of people and I want to, I want to create a culture where we erase blame. We, there's no blaming on this show. We don't blame nobody, but you, my, my, my projects that didn't sell is my fault. They ain't nobody else's fault. My, my songs that didn't do hot on the radio. It's my fault. That's not on nobody. It's not on my radio promoter. That's not on my manager. Listen, I had a real call with somebody who was, um, and I'm going to say their name. I was working with um, somebody Nicole, named Nicole Hayward. And Nicole Hayward was very, very helpful to me in my career. But I had some bitterness towards Nicole for a while because I felt like Nicole should have did more for me. And God had to convict me in my spirit the other week. And he said, you better call her and forgive her. It had been years and years and years. I called Nicole. I said, Nicole, you know what? I said, all you did was try to help me. And I blamed you for some stuff. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You know, and gospel is the is the biggest industry to me, and maybe because I'm in it, 
that just lies to themselves and makes excuses and complains, blames the church, blames um, your minister in music, blames everybody but yourself. It's your fault. It's your fault you playing music you don't like. It's your fault. It's your fault you at a church that you don't like the pastor. That's your fault. It's your fault that you continue to stay there and take a check and have no character identity. That's your fault. This artist to artist, y'all, I'm keep it real in here. We keep it real in here. We talk and we discuss things. This is this is what I want this place to be, because if the more we do this, the more people will take ownership on who they are. Like you can't blame the music industry for um, where stuff is, because you know why? The, 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 as long as I've been out here in L.A., two and a half years, I've met a lot of people, people who have been who are at the top of the top working in really top companies. And you know what? They in there trying to figure it out. They don't have all the answers. They be people be asking me, yo, you know, any, like who's hot right now? Who's doing what? Like tell them they don't know either. So you blame in the industry and the industry still trying to figure it out, too. So, Marco, I'm sorry. This is knowledge right here, dude. You from shot. Yeah, yeah. So, what's up, Corey? I'm born and raised in Chicago. I live in um, Los Angeles now. Yep, definitely. Shot town, born and raised. Um, on the playground is where I spend most of my days. <laughs> so, Marco says, takes money to create. Well, Marco, it takes money to do anything. I mean, I'm not trying to be cynical, but... Let's be let's be honest. We keep it one hundred. In in what you do in poetry, and that what you do well, like that's that's your that's your gift. Your because your your brand is Marco the poet. So that's amazing branding that you put in your name, Marco the poet. So automatically we know this guy is a poet. It don't take money to write a poem, bro. It, this like the issue isn't. Um, isn't it's not a money thing, you know? Uh, hold on one second, my computer is trying to go to sleep. I don't want to lose you. It's not a money thing about creating. It's a creation thing and a blockage thing, and a lot of people are getting blocked. We're we're blocking our creative process because we're thinking way too much about money. And we're thinking about way too much about what people think about us. I'm sorry. I got other comments coming in. Somebody. Well, hey, what's up, Joey? What's good, bro? What's up, Stefan? What's good? What's good? Got some uh, Houston people jumping in. And uh, shout out to Houston, um, which is like my second home. Love Houston. Um, just great people. Um, great family city, man. Like great, great city. Lakewood Church. You know, just my. I just Houston's such a great place, man. Like anyone who lives in Houston, I want you guys to like take a second and realize you live in one of the greatest cities in the world. Like appreciate where you are, what you have, the things that you're able to do in that great city. Uh, so Tani asks, so what would you say to someone who can't play an instrument? Singing is not the best, but they can write like a maniac. How can they break into the industry? So that's an, first of all, that's an amazing question. Um, secondly, I would say, um, I believe this is what I truly believe. I believe that everybody has some sort of ability to write songs because writing songs is storytelling. I would say, um, get into a place where you can start sharing your, sharing your story scenarios. So case in point. Let's say you've got your Instagram account and you start using memes. Memes are so huge right now. Why don't you start you putting lyrics up as memes, like small little chunks of memes or using your Facebook statuses um, with lyrical content? And you don't necessarily tell people their lyrics. You just be smart about it. Just make them like quotes. Figure out how you can start being in more of a storytelling type vibe um, even before because there's several ways too. because you can just start hitting people up like, yo, I'm, I'm a songwriter. That works, too. 
But I think in 2018, you can like you can just start being so much more creative than just trying to get on as a songwriter. You I want you to start considering yourself as a storyteller. Storytellers are the ones that really find a way to make the magic happen, because as you start writing, you can start finding there may be context of things um, that can come together. He like, you never know what you could be creating. You could be creating a television show. You could be creating a movie. You could be creating a message. You may you may be on TED Talks. It, there's no telling what can happen. My encouragement would be write it. So the Bible says write the vision, make it plain. Okay. It's not content until it comes out of your brain and it gets on the paper and you've got something that says this is actually something. So, or, so you've got the meme idea or what if you did some video and you just, um, this is a really huge on YouTube where people are, they'll take motivational speakers and they'll put like music behind it and they'll have motivational speakers like talking with music playing behind it and it gets people fired up. So maybe you, if you don't sing, which is relative because, you know, I think a lot of us are so much more critical of our own singing voices and we're thinking about what somebody told us about ourselves that we just go, nope, nope. And that's something I actually wrote wrote down today I want to talk about is dealing with insecurities. Um, but um, so there's several different ways. And also, you know, just hit people up. Like, yo, I want you to check out these lyrics I wrote, you know, which can also be tricky, too, because you don't know the direction some people want to go with writing. So are you writing gospel? Are you writing worship? Are you writing love songs? Are you doing R&B? Are you doing pop? Like figure out where those people are and hang out like where those communities are and get in those communities and just start making it happen. Um, so let me get back. Marco politics are also involved in six. Yeah. You know, politics, it's tricky too because you know there there are those things that do happen where you'd be like how so and so get such and such and you know like wait that does happen but here's another thing let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago oh man singers are so critical of, of themselves um, <laughs> I can tell y'all some stories man like just being in the studio there's some so. I've I have the privilege of working like with really really dope singers like and as a producer all of my friends that are great singers they all trust me so none of them are like oh Jay you gonna have me out there bad I have the ability one of my gifts is that when I get people in the studio people are extremely comfortable I don't make anybody feel uncomfortable in the studio I've seen oh thank you Tony Y'all feel free to share this post. I've seen producers make the whole room so uncomfortable. And I mean, that's their process, but I'm sitting there like, why are you making everything feel like the world is hinging on this note? Why are you making it seem like if they don't sing this note, they're going to die of malaria? Why are you acting like if somebody don't sing something right, that there's going to be... Um, a bomb that hits this place. Why are you acting like if somebody don't sing this note right, they're, um, they're going to get a flesh-eating bacteria? Like, I think producers go so far and they, in the name of thinking they're a great producer that they really ain't really that hot. It's like you're trying to... So like, let's deal with insecurities. It, the, it's, an insecure, it's an insecure producer that's going to make the room uncomfortable. If you ever been in a room with Donald Lawrence, Donald Lawrence don't make any room uncomfortable. Who's better than Donald Lawrence at producing vocals? I want to see, show of hands, who you know that's better. Nobody. Donald ain't going to make nobody feel uncomfortable. Number one, 
He not going to produce you if you ain't supposed to be in the room. Period. Point blank in the discussion. So as producers, when you producing people, you should be asking yourself, does this person need to be in the room? If the answer is yes, then ask yourself, do how should I be communicating with people? Because I think as I've done personality um, study and training, I realize that people don't want to be treated the way you want to be treated. People want to be treated the way they want to be treated. I'm going to say that again. The, there's a saying that says, treat others like you want to be treated. That's not true. You treat others the way they desire to be treated. It's two different concepts. So if Tani, if I'm working with Tani and she comes into my studio and I know Tani might be like more shy, reserved, might have a little insecurity, might have had some situations in her past. And I know that saying the wrong thing can trigger her breaking down. I'm only going to build her up the whole time she's in there. I'm gassing her up big time. I'm finding all the great things to say about her big time, big time, big time, big time. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to make Tawny go, man, the last time I was in the studio, they beat me up. They ate me alive. No, I was talking to somebody and, and their husband actually is, is a producer. And um, she was working with me on some stuff. And she was like, Man, my husband makes me so uncomfortable in the studio. Like, we can't get nothing done. And I'm like, like, what's up? She's like, oh, he just, he just trashes me. Like, and then like when it's over, he just be acting like nothing happened. And I'm like, so I work with my wife in the studio and I know that, you know, I have to push her, but I don't, I don't make her feel uncomfortable. Like we don't have the sessions where we just like, we ain't finna do this. I can't do that. Because I know I know how to push the buttons. You gotta know how to push the right buttons for people to get them to where they need to be. And that's what the producer is supposed to do. Um, so I wanna get some tips on dealing with insecurities. And um, I'm just gonna be real. Like one insecurity I've always had is definitely with my singing voice. I um Coming out of college, all of my friends knew I could play. They knew I could write. <clears throat> but when it came to singing, they were like, Jay, you should never, just don't sing. You should just write and play. Don't You don't ever need to sing. And so I internalized all that. And so it made me extremely insecure with trying to sing in front of people. Um, it made me seem like people were going to laugh at me. And they probably have. But um, I fought through that on my second project. I said, I'm going to sing a lot more and I'm going to produce more because I got to get this. I got to get this load off my shoulder. I've got to press and do something more than I've ever done. And so tip one to deal dealing with your insecurities is you got to face them head on. Your insecurities ain't going to go away by you avoiding them. You can't avoid your insecurities. You can't avoid the elephant in the room. You can't. It's just like when you play baseball, they always say the ball going to find you. I've seen people, and this this happened to me when I played baseball. I love playing the outfield because the ball didn't come to me all the time, but I could make pretty decent plays in the outfield. But I never wanted to play first base um, because I felt like I got to do too much. And sure enough, one day, one of the kids was missing from the team. And my coach put me at first base. First play of the game, ground ball right to me. I was like petrified. Ball bounced up, hit my leg, running against the first base. And I'm like, dang, why me? And so insecure people always asking, why me? But you need to start asking, why not you? 
Because until you learn how to like look that thing in the mirror and go, okay, I'm never going to be Luther. I'm never going to be R. Kelly. I'm never going to be Joe. I'm never going to be Zaccardi. But guess what? Ain't none of them J. Shep. I'm me. I'm going to be J. Shep wherever I go. And once I determined that I was going to be me and only me, I can't do runs like Isaac Carey. I can't sing like Daryl Walls. I can't dance like Chris Brown. I, that ain't never happening. I wasn't graced with that. But I was graced with an ability to do something great. And so the first tip is, with dealing with insecurities is you got to face it head on. I have a fear of singing in front of people. Other than that, my family and a few friends, very few knows that I can hold a tune or two. See, and it comes from, sometimes it comes from somebody could have told you, like I said, you know, and th these were my friends telling me. And I, I remember I did a, um, my friend, um, Kaya, um, who's a, an amazing singer, had me do a song with her. And she was like, I want you to sing on my, um, project with me Jay and I was like okay so here I am singing with her wow and then somebody was like that's a nice song but you shouldn't have sang on it and I have to say pause I was like first of all I wrote the song and second of all they didn't ask you to sing so pause on the negativity that you're bringing to me because you weren't asked to do anything on the record but you got an opinion on the record so here's tip number two. Don't accept other people's opinion. Don't accept their opinion, good or bad. You know why? Because an opinion doesn't always have to be rooted in truth. It can have facts, but you know, and everybody wants facts, but what's rooted in truth, man? What's rooted in truth for you? And, and many of the people that are, um, Critics, they they supposed to be your peers. Your peers ain't supposed to be your critics. Your peers are just supposed to be that. Let's let's take it back again. Kelly Clarkson should not have nothing to say about the Migos. Why? They don't have nothing to do with each other. Like you be great over here and sell your records, and you go over here and sell your records. It's, it's, it's becoming so out of hand now where we, we just internalize way too much of what people think. So you got to eliminate the opinions of people. You got to. Tip number three to eliminate securities. You got to work your butt off. You got to work. You got to put the work in. A lot of times people are insecure because they're not putting in that work. You didn't practice. You didn't rehearse and you know, you just going up there winging it. You're not going to put the work in. If you're not going to like put hours and hours and hours in, you're going to, you're going to stay insecure because the person who is in the gym two hours a day and eating right, why are they going to think they fat? They, they know they ain't fat. They know they in shape, they eating right and they're working out. They don't have to worry about what their body looks like because they've got muscle memory. It's they got they got everything in this right place, in this proper place. So the people that are dealing with insecurities have started bad habits. A lot of a lot of us have bad habits because we've allowed people to speak things over us. We've accepted it. And so we've accepted bad habits and we don't ever practice or get a routine in front of us that makes us better. Number four, get a good mentor. Like get a good, good mentor. <clears throat> get somebody that can like talk to you, tell you the truth, but like their truth builds you up. Like you, the truth should never like break you down to make you want to quit. The truth should only build you up. I don't understand people who have these mentors that like almost torture them. That's I'm like, what are you, a masochist? Like, I'm not into that. I want people, not who going to pump me up, but 
But I want people who are going to tell me the truth and it's going to build me up. It's not just telling me things, oh, you're so great, you're so good. But the building is, in their critique of you, is building. In their critique of you, they're finding what's great about you. Um, my first, um, the first person who actually told me I have talent was my band teacher in high school. I was 16 years old and I played the trumpet and <laughs> we had a, uh, I think it was a final exam or a midterm is one or the other. And so for band, we have to play these crazy arpeggiated scales in every key. And then we have to pick out a piece to play. So that was our assignment <clears throat> for this, this huge exam. So he gave us two and a half months to work on this stuff. So I picked the piece, stayed in my backpack for two months, got the scales. You know, we would do the scales every day in band. So I was a little bit re more ready for the scales. This piece, I wasn't ready. So he gave us um, that last week before the finals, he let us work on our pieces during band, um, like have individual practice time in the practice rooms. And so y'all know what I did. I was I goofed off that whole time. I halfway practiced, you know, and then it's the day before the exam. I'm at home trying to like cram and practice. I'm I'm really in there trying thinking I'm getting it in like I got this test tomorrow. And so I get to school the next day and uh I play and we got through the scales, you know, pretty good. And then I got to the piece which is so hard. It was like on a scale of 1 to 10 for a trumpet player, um that piece was like a 9. Okay, it was a nine. It was a, like that on the scale of difficulty. It was a nine. It was crazy difficult. And so um, I got through it. I sight read it and um, I kind of crashed, but I, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And so my band teacher just looked at me the whole time and this really, he's a really tall white guy. His name was Mr. Jastro. Mr. Jastro was about 6'6", just like a string bean. And um, he looked at me and his voice was like this. He said, Jason, I'm very disappointed in you. And so I'm like, okay, here we go. I knew, so I was ready for this. Like, okay, I sucked. Just tell me I sucked so I can go. The next thing that he said after he said he was disappointed, he said, you have so much talent and you don't even realize it. And I was like, I have talent. Never heard that before in my life. So in, in the midst of him critiquing me, he built me up. I bombed that test. I got like a D, a C minus or something. It was terrible. But in the midst of that, he built me up. So what he could have said, F, get out of here. You're terrible. You suck. You should never play the trumpet again. Like, had he said that, I would have just been like, okay. I would have laughed and never done music. I never would have gone into music if it wasn't for that moment, him telling me I had talent. That moment was the thing that kicked it off for me that said, man, I actually have talent. So I started thinking about like, what does it mean to have talent? I really started asking myself like, why, like, why would he say I had talent? And so after that, he would see me working harder. He was giving me more solos and jazz band. And he saw me like growing as a musician. And then I was like, I told him one day, I said, I told, I said, Mr. Jasher, I'm thinking about majoring in music. His face lit up. He was like, you're going to do great. I was like, you think so? He was like, no, you're going to do great. And I was like, but I don't know if I want to, you know, keep trumpet as my focus. He was like, it doesn't matter. He was like, it doesn't matter. Like you're going to do great in this area. So when you find that mentor 
that can tell you that thing. And, you know, I, I realize I'm in that position for some people now. And, you know, I don't mind mentoring people. I love doing it. I love to see what people are going and, and seeing, like, their growth and, and, and where they are. And just, you know, you want your students to surpass you. You want them to to raise up and, and, and be amazing. I look at my boy, my brother, Ryan Booker, and seeing what he's doing. You know, Ryan... <clears throat> Uh, Ryan was was right at St. Luke Church. I remember seeing him write songs and, you know, I would be on him hard in rehearsals, but only to build him up. And I see what he's doing now. I'm just like, bro, I'll be calling him for advice. You know, like. We got to figure out a way to come together as communities, do do more of these type of platforms to build people up. Because we, we've created a, a, an excuse culture. We blame the industry. We blame radio stations. We blame, um, hey, what's up, Stella? So shout out to Stella, who was my first radio promoter when she promoted Solution. Stella was working so hard um, for that record. She worked so hard for that record, and I appreciate her for that. She was get, sending me on interviews like, having me call people way across the country like daily and I appreciate what she um the work that she put in for me that's been about almost 10 years ago um but the excuse culture in our industry just has to stop there's no more excuses it's like there's nobody who can tell you what you can't do you know you used to have to have a lot of money to to have a show now you can set your phone up in front of you with a microphone and you speak to people all over the world. Case in point, this is artist to artist. I want to sit here and build you guys up. Um, I did have a few uh, little music news and nuggets. Um, if you guys, let me know if you guys have any questions or anything. So Apple, um, tech giant, <laughs> biggest company in, war, in the world has bought Shazam, which is crazy because the other day I'm in the car and I was telling my wife, I was like, man, you know what will be crazy? I was like, what if Spotify bought Shazam? I think Spotify needs to buy Shazam. And here I look and Apple has bought Shazam. Crazy. What does that mean for, for us? Um, number one, Shazam has technology it was the first type of music technology that would recognize um songs that are being played instantaneously and so now you've got others that are out sound hound there's a few others um so what that means now for apple is is going to be groundbreaking because with alexa the, the Alexa speakers that uh, Amazon has put out, Apple is working on theirs now. And so they had they wanted to get the best technology they could possibly get uh, within this uh, Shazam. And um, it's going to change how we do life even more. Uh, voice The voice recognition technology is, that's the future, y'all. Like, got to get, like, for real. So... I think that's a huge deal. I think what's um, with this um, purchase, though, the European Union has put a pause on Apple's deal to buy Shazam because what they're afraid of in Europe is that Apple is, is going to create some huge music streaming monopoly, which I don't think they're going to have much of a case for that. Because Spotify has over 90 million users. Like crazy. But I think what it's going to do for Apple and their brand is it's just going to take the voice recognition technology to a whole new level, a whole new platform. So Apple has bought Shazam. So look for that merger to be completed by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Man, it was so good seeing you, Janine. Janine is one of the most encouraging people ever. I appreciate Janine. Like, I've been, man, I've met her 
about what was it 2006 or seven through Buster and she been working she was singing like I've seen her sing 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 and now she's doing her you know behind the scenes management things and we definitely gonna um partner up oh, yep oh six we're gonna partner up on some stuff um because it's important I think I think what's really missing is community like artists we have to create communities like the only way so think about this <clears throat> I live in Inglewood California and which is a you know right you know right within the whole greater Los Angeles community but what if there was what if there were no gas stations here what if there was no nowhere to shop? You know, now we are kind of in the food desert. The food options here are not that great. But what if literally we just had a house here and nothing else? Communities are built when you you create stabilization. You create entities that feed into others. So artists, you can't just sing you can't just write you can't just rap you got to have some other things that you can do this is so this is another reason why this platform is being built because i see a need you got to jump in where the need is and you got to know you have a gift where the need is i know where i know where my gifts lie so building platforms such as this and finding other people to partner with is really how you start to build into something, to build your brand, to build your face, like, and to build others, like real talk. Um, so, <clears throat> so you saw the news of, I told you about the news about Apple buying Shazam. Also read some other news about Spotify giving this app a facelift for its free users. Um, so if you have Spotify and I'm a pay, I'm a premium Spotify user. So I pay 10 bucks a month for all of the privileges that Spotify um, yields. And I pay the $10 a month because I'm also a practitioner on the app. I use, I use it all the time now. Like I'm an artist and I use it, I share it, I understand its functionality, I understand its value. I also pay for, for Apple Music. So I pay for those two music streaming services. I don't have Tidal. I was debating, should I get Tidal? I may break down and get it by the end of this year. Um, not a huge practitioner on Tidal. But um, the, free, the free element on Spotify was limited. Like they really limited what you could listen to and everything had to be in shuffle mode. So what they're doing now in Spotify is um, they're giving you, I think there's like 15 playlists now that you can listen to um, and you don't have to shuffle, which is huge for them. Um, because I guess a lot of people were complaining, you know, you, when stuff is free, a lot of times people say, well, you get what you get. But Spotify realizes now that they've gone public, um, their IPO is doing really well, and they've got money coming out out of their you know what's. So money is not going to be an issue. They just want more users, and they want the experience of the users to be great while they're on the app. What they realize is, is that somebody could be on that app for free. But eventually they're saying we've got high conversion rates of people who are on the app for free who finally end up being paid users. So the people who complain about streaming rates, especially on a platform like Spotify, is because there's so many free users on the con on the on the um, on the platform that it's hard for them to. Um, so let's say. So my song Blessings right now is about 18,000 streams on Spotify. So thank you guys for those who supported it and played it. 
So let's say out of those 18,000 streams on Spotify, half of those are from free users. That means that half of those spins that I get on Spotify are going to be at a reduced rate than the ones that are paid. So the frustration with artists is that is the, the inconsistency of what you pay. You can't get like title. There's no free tier of title. There's no free tier of Apple music, which is why they can give you higher payouts, but you also have less people to choose from. Same thing with YouTube, you know, they're, they're free. I mean, they're um, paid uh, tiers for YouTube, but I'm not paying for a YouTube subscription. I haven't found a need to pay for one. Um, so just interesting news from um, from Spotify that they're they're changing some things to make the user experience um, a lot better. Um, <clears throat> if anyone ever has any music streaming questions, feel free to ask them here. I'm a huge proponent of it. I believe that music streaming is not just the present, but it's definitely the future. And I'm looking forward to other things that come out of it because it's really the way that you begin to build your platform and your brand. Uh, my homie, Phil Jones, I see he just jumped in. I'm going to play a little bit of Phil Jones while he's on here. So Phil is one of my um, one of my favorite, favorite people. He's definitely a, a dope person. Um, but he put out this this um, record a couple year, years ago. Jesus beats and keyboards. And when I tell you, man, this album is a breath of fresh air. And this song is like, can't win for losing. One of my favorite songs. Let you guys listen to a little bit. And take it as a loss to build it up again. And it could be perfect. I could imagine. Phil Jones, man, got like, he's got, like, his voice is crazy. Like, so even, I'm, I always marvel at people who can sing like this, produce like that, and play like that. And he mixed his own record. I'm like, because I remember when I first heard his stuff, I said, hey, man, who working with you? He was like, oh, that's all me. I was like, nah, bro. Like, who did these tracks? He was like, that's me. I was like, well, who mixed your record? He was like, me. I was like, are you kidding me? Phil, Phil Jones is a rare breed. Um, I think he danced a little bit, too. Um, so I keep on nudging him to put out another record. Um he don't want to. I'm going to get him on this show to interview him. I'm going I'm to get him to do another record. Like, I'm going like, to convince him. Because bro is, like, mad talented. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit more music. Um, Cheryl Fortune. Um, this song, Don't Apologize. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Woke up feeling sad, way up, way up. You're alive and well, so you won't complain too much. Say you're feeling blessed, man. You're prayed up, prayed up. You see another day, your bills are paid. Like what's up? What's up? They say you win, now you can't lose. They asking questions, what's up with you? There ain't no way you're satisfied. You're just so happy living life. What they don't know is sometimes they get crazy. Yeah. Trying to keep food on the table. Yeah. Some need you working and working. 
us, so don't see the fruit of your labor. But we got our own little secret, cause we know you're covered in favor. Even when I take a little longer, you know you're a child of the Savior. That's why you're beautiful, just the way you are. Man, Cheryl Fortune. Dude, like, so her writing, her vocals, the production, just perfect. Like, um, I was having a conversation with her yesterday, and um, I was like, man, who produced that? And I think somebody named Cedric produced that, said something. And I was like, that was, I'm like, the chemistry. She was like, yeah, that was the first time they had ever worked together. And I was like, I said, I'm just going to be real, though. I was like, he had a, a, an amazing canvas to work with. Like, that, like, every, like how everybody feels about Brandy, I think people are going to be feeling that way about Cheryl Fortune. That's just, I just, I just got that feeling that people are going to start feeling that way about her. I can't wait to sit down and interview her. She has a great story. Um. And I, I want to talk to some more artists, man. I want <clears throat> to do more interviews. So if there's any artists that are out there that, you know, you feel I should know, and it doesn't even have to be music. It could be film. It could be television, music, dance, whatever it is, whatever it is creative. I want to sit down and, and just really talk to people about their process. And I want to get their insight and I want to get inspiration. This is what artist to artist is all about. Um, we just want to share, give great information and just help people be great in what they do. So feel free to share this post. Um, this is Jay Shep. I'm glad to be here with you guys. I'm going to be back again tomorrow. So if there's anything that you want me to talk about, want me to discuss, um, you want to jump into the discussion, charity war from Detroit. Okay. Can you, um, Corey, can you send me, so you know what is charity war the singer? I'm going to see it there. Um, Let's do this live on the air. Charity Ward. I don't see. Okay. If you can um <clears throat> give me some info on on um on charity, like any music, just just shoot it to me. I don't I don't see uh their information on Spotify, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Um so yeah, shoot me some info and I'm gonna um check them out. Oh, Shayna Wilson. I'm gonna play a little bit of Shayna Wilson. Yeah, see, she just sent her her open. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um my phone's going out, but I still wanna play a little bit more music. So this song, um Shayna Wilson Williams. It's in the room. I hit her up yesterday. And um, I told her this song is going to be number one. It's going to be number one. Get ready. Within the next, give it a good eight weeks. Give it a good eight weeks. This song will be number one. I'm going to fast forward this. Shout out to Shayna, um, Shayna Wilson Williams for creating this. Um, it's in the room. 
song's gonna be number one. Definitely gonna be number one. It may take about eight weeks, ten weeks, you know, because it, it takes time for things like that to just kind of get in people's spirit. Once that song get in people's spirit, it's over. It's over. I hit her like I hit her. I don't even know her personally, but I hit her up yesterday. I was like, this song is going to be number one. So I, I believe I'm the first person who spoke that. I, mean, I don't know if I am, but that song's going to be number one. Going to be number one. That's why it's in my playlist. I put that song in my playlist. As soon as I heard it, I was like, that's going to my playlist because that song is going to be number one. It is. It's undeniable. You're going to have worship teams singing that all over the world. It's in the room. It's in the room. Our Father hears us. It's in the room. And all fear is gone. Man, I might do that Sunday. I may find a way to work that into uh, <clears throat> to the set list on Sunday for uh, worship. Um. Yeah, I think that might be it. All right. I'm going to be back with you guys tomorrow. Another episode of Artist to Artist. I am your host, Jay Shep. So make sure you guys hit me up in my inbox or shoot me an email, therealjshep at me.com. I'm glad that you guys have decided to jump in. I'm going to play a little bit of my song, Blessings, before we go, because I believe that blessings are falling on you. I need y'all on your feet, come on. Clap, 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 clap. Get those blessings. Get those blessings. Throw them up in the air. In the air. In the air. Everybody say blessings are falling, falling down on me. Blessings are falling. All right, y'all. Peace and blessings. Wrapped in the love.